So Abraham is sitting at the entrance of his tent, looking for guests to invite into his home. But this was actually three days after he had undergone circumcision at the age of 99. Ouch. And God sends him three angels disguised as people. And Abraham was able to entertain them, feed them, because that was Abraham's greatest desire, to help and bestow kindness on others. But what were these three angels doing? God could have sent people. Why did he send angels? Well, one of them, Rashi says, was sent to tell Sarah that she would have a child at the age of 90. The second one was sent to destroy the city of Sodom. And the third one was to heal Abraham. The Midrash, however, has a different take on these three angels and identifies them, gives them titles. One angel was the merchant of the desert. The second angel was the merchant of produce. And the third one was the captain of the sea. Now, the Midrash doesn't just tell us frivolous things. There is a deep message and lesson embedded in these parables that are there to teach us how to become better people, better Jews. So what is the Midrash really trying to tell us? We'll leave that until the end. I want to change the subject to talk about something very fundamental about what it means to be a Jew. The question that many people ask, who was the first Jew? And the answer is, that everyone is aware of and familiar with, Abraham. Abraham was the first Jew. So the question is, why was Abraham the first Jew? Why not Noah? Noah, we read in the Torah, was a righteous man, a very righteous person. God saved him in spite of the fact that he destroyed everyone else. He saved him and his family. Why don't we consider him to be the first Jew? That's one question. Another question is, we call Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob our patriarchs. They're our fathers. In Hebrew, we actually refer to them as Avinu, our father. Why and how could we refer to people who lived 3,500 plus years ago as our father? There's nothing genetic that we inherit from someone going back so many generations, centuries, millennia. So in what way are they, there? Are they our father? We should call them our ancestors. We should call them our grandparents going back many thousands of years. But why are they called our fathers? Moreover, the Talmud says we only have three fathers and four mothers. That's it. Well, why not call other great people our fathers and mothers if they have bequeathed to us so many nice things and positive things? And the answer to these questions is that just like a father and a mother bequeath to their children genetic material, the same thing is true about spiritual gen genetic material. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the matriarchs as well, bequeath to us and bestowed upon us spiritual genetic material. And those are the only people who we could say are our fathers and mothers because we inherited their genes, their spiritual genes. What are their spiritual genes? And what's the difference between Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? So our sages tell us that there are three things upon which the world stands. Torah, the study of Torah. Avodah, which is service, that refers to the sacrifices and subsequently to prayer. And gemilus chasodim, acts of kindness. And the three patriarchs parallel these three traits. We'll start with Jacob. Jacob is identified with Torah. Jacob sits in the tents, which refers to the tents of Torah. And Jacob bequeathed to us the intellectual power, the wherewithal, to learn Torah and to flourish in the study of Torah. The fact that Jews are known to be very smart, as the Torah itself says, is because of our connection to Torah that we inherited from Jacob. Yes, some people use their knowledge, their abilities, their intellectual abilities for other things as well, but where does it really come from? It came from the gift that was given to us and we inherited from Jacob. Then we have Isaac. What did Isaac bequeath to us? Prayer, the power of prayer. Isaac was a sacrifice on Mount Moriah and Isaac is associated then with serving God and the power of prayer. The Jewish people throughout 
their whole history knew how to pray. Maybe it's because Jews know how to kvetch. They know how to complain. So we complain to God. But what prayer is, is in fact saying to God, we want certain things. And that gift to be able to approach God and speak to him and demand things from him and connect to him through prayer, we got that from Isaac. What did we get from Abraham? Abraham was the paragon of virtue in terms of kindness. As we see in the story here, he was in pain, not because of the circumcision, but primarily because there were no guests that he could entertain, that he could help, that he could bestow his kindness upon them. Abraham was the personification of chesed, of kindness. There's a Kabbalistic source that says that God's attribute of kindness complained to God, God, as soon as Abraham came into this world, I'm unemployed. They don't need me anymore because Abraham took over the trait of kindness. Abraham bequeathed that to the Jewish people. And if you look around the Jewish world today and historically, you'll see that Jews were always on the forefront of movements that were devoted to helping others. Now, some of those movements veered away from Jewish values. Uh, we know that tragically in the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, the Jews in Russia were at the forefront of the revolution that brought communism, the evil of communism to the world, which destroyed who knows how many Jews. But they were motivated by doing good. I remember when I came to Buffalo in 1972, there were many tables with different movements, and there were basically about three or four different socialist, communist movements, and who manned them was mostly, if not entirely, Jews. Now, we can't agree with their cause, but we have to be very proud of the fact that even when Jews go off the path, they still retain this idea that I have to help, we have to do something for the rest of society. So that we got from Abraham. Now, of all the three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Abraham was singled out for special recognition. The Talmud tells us, and Rashi quotes this, that in our prayers, the Amidah, the most central prayer, we talk about the patriarchs. We talk about how God is the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. We mention all three. However, when we conclude that blessing, we conclude it just with mention of Abraham. Blessed are you, God, the shield of Abraham. Not the shield of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That tells you that there's something unique about Abraham, even relative to Isaac and Jacob. Now we can understand why Abraham is considered the first Jew and not his ancestor Noah, who was a righteous person, because the world cannot really survive without Abraham's trait of extending his kindness and love to others. The whole motivation for creation of the world, we're taught, is ki chesed, who God desires to do kindness. There was no one around to ask God, please create a world, no one to do anything that would motivate God. God was motivated simply by his desire for kindness, to bestow his energy, his light, his beneficence on a world. And that's what motivated creation. And Abraham was the one who took over, you could say, as a matter of speech, from God's desire to do good, and he implemented that trait of kindness into society. That's what we mean by the first Jew, the first person who took God's kindness and implemented that into the world and transmitted this to his progeny. Now, we could say that Abraham bequeathed to us the software of kindness that was placed into the hardware of our personalities. So every Jew, even if a Jew lives now, 3,700 years removed from Abraham, we have those spiritual genes of kindness. So important is Abraham's trait of kindness that our sages tell us something else remarkable. In the very beginning of Genesis, after the whole story of creation is concluded, the Torah sums up the creation. These are the chronicles of creation and the day that God created the world. That's more or less a paraphrase. The Hebrew word when they were created is bihi baram, which if you rearrange those letters, it reads be avraham, that God created the world for the sake of Abraham, which means 
that the world couldn't possibly exist without Abraham's trait. And that explains why the, Midra, the Talmud says that although we start off the prayer with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because they're all our fathers, we inherited their traits, they're all programmed into our souls, nevertheless, it's Abraham with whom we conclude because it begins with Abraham and it ends with Abraham. How do we bring about the Messianic age? How do we bring about redemption? The major focus has to be on reaching out to inspiring others, giving them whatever they need physically, materially, and spiritually. This explains what the Rebbe, when it was asked by a reporter from CNN, what is the message to the whole world? And the Rebbe said, to add in doing a little bit more goodness and kindness. Now, of course, there are many other things that we have to do that are important, the study of Torah, the observance of all the commandments, but what is the single most crucial component to make the world a complete world, it's the need for kindness, to share the good with others. So Abraham not only gives us our genetic material for kindness, but he justifies and validates the whole creation of the world. And that's why Abraham is the first Jew, and among the patriarchs, he's the one with whom the world began and with whom the world will end entering into the glorious age of redemption. Okay, so now we have an understanding of what Abraham means to us. He's more than just a wonderful personality that we revere, and we like to talk about, just like we like to talk about our grandparents and great-grandparents, we inherit, we have his traits in us. And the challenge that we have, as well as the challenge to emulate Isaac and Jacob, is for us to dig deep into our consciousness to find that genetic material of kindness and to make it the manifest way of behaving in all of our lives. Let's return to the Midrash. Abraham is now ailing, and God sends him three angels. And these angels, the Midrash says, one is the one in charge of the desert, the merchant of the desert, one is in charge of produce, the merchant of produce, and one is the sea captain. So commentators point out that these three angels represent the whole world. Because if you look at the earth, the earth is made up of desert, desolate, barren land and uninhabitable. Then produce represents the part of the world that produces life and sustenance, so it's habitable. And then you have the sea. And these are the three angels because the angels are charged with the responsibility to manage these three parts of creation. But these angels can't do the job on their own. God sends them to Abraham. What does that mean in spiritual terms? This means that God says, look, I have a world here. The world consists of three parts. There's a desert, there's inhabitable land, and there's the sea. And you are in charge of all this, but I want you to bring all this to Abraham, to instill Abraham's trait in creation, because creation without Abraham's trait is incomplete. Okay, so now we know that Abraham is the one charged with the responsibility to make the world the ideal world that it was intended to be by bringing the angels to Abraham. But when do the angels bring the world to Abraham? It happens after circumcision. Why do they wait for circumcision? Abraham had a long career until he was 99 years old and certainly was known for his kindness and his righteousness throughout his life. So why did they come after circumcision? So there are two points to it. Number one, circumcision is what made Abraham complete. It's what completed Abraham's identity as the first Jew, as the one who personified divine kindness. And it's interesting that the word Bihibaram, when it was created, which rearranged means Abraham, Be'evraham, with Abraham, that's Abraham, the name that he got after circumcision. So it means that where did Abraham get his power to affect the world, to change the world, to make the world a kinder place? It happened after circumcision when his spiritual energy reached its zenith. 
But there's another point also. Circumcision is performed on the reproductive organ, which means that Abraham on his own could not change the world. What Abraham needed was children, descendants, a nation that would implement his program. So when Abraham is now circumcised and he reaches the point in life where he's going to become a father of the Jewish nation, he fathered Isaac a year later, that's the point where the angels come with the world to Abraham and say, Abraham, here's the world. You are the perfect person. Guide the world. Give the world what it needs in order for it to flourish and for it to reach its intended goal of bringing about the messianic age. But just like there's a macro world, there's also a micro world. We all have those three traits. We have the desert and the angel of the desert within us. We have produce and the angel of produce within us, the power to produce, to be productive. And then we have the sea captain, the captain of the sea in us. These are three stages in our lives as individuals and as a people. Part of us is a parched desert, a desert that has no life, that has no growth, that has no substance. It's just an arid, dry, an uninhabitable part of our personality. It's when a person is down in the dumps, when a person is depressed. How do you deal with depression? I'm not talking about clinical depression necessarily, because for that you might need professional help with medication in many cases. But even clinically depressed people could benefit from this as well as the traditional ways of treating it. But certainly people who are just depressed because things in life are not going their way, they are like a desert. So what does God do? He sends the angel of the desert, the power within us of the desert-like personality that we have, and he says, take it to Abraham, bestow acts of kindness, do good for others, and you will not be depressed. And recent studies have borne that out, that when people are depressed and they do things to help others, that changes and reverses their depression. But, the, but depression is only one thing for which we need kindness. Then we have the merchant of produce. That's the part of our lives that are very productive. We're achieving, we're growing, we're developing, we're reaching higher levels of success in our lives. We're really going somewhere in our lives and we're happy and everything is great. So you might think, do we need to do acts of kindness? My life is great without the acts of kindness. But then all you have to do is look at mid midlife crisis that people have that all of a sudden, people who are very successful, eminently successful, say to themselves, what's my life all about? I have no purpose in life. There's no meaning to my life. And then they go out and they'll buy themselves a sports car or engage in some other entertaining experience to drown out their depression, which is strange because they're very successful. As successful as you may be in your own development and even spiritual development, you cannot be content without going to Abraham, to reaching into the Abraham gene in our soul that is designed for us to reach out beyond ourselves to help others. And then we have the sea captain, or the captain of the sea. Sea is known for its storms, which could drown and, and sink a ship. And sometimes our own lives are, are filled with stormy experiences and relationships, and our lives are becoming miserable. How do we deal with it? How do we deal with the storms in our life? And again, it's with Abraham, through Abraham's love and kindness. And when I say love and kindness, I'm referring until now to what we do for others, but it also means our love directed to God. Because if you don't love God, ultimately, you won't love his creations. And it works the other way around. If you don't love his creations, you won't love God. The two go together. Right now, we're living in an age where we're experiencing all three. We have parts of the world where, and in our lives where there's a desert. We feel parched. We feel empty. We feel that there is nothing going on. We're empty. We're va vacuous. And then there's the part of our lives and of the world that experiences tremendous growth. We've never had as much growth and production materially and even spiritually, intellectually, as we have today. And then you also have storms brewing in the world. And I don't have to go into detail to all the things that are going on, COVID-19, so on and so forth. These are the final 
experiences before the ultimate redemption, and how do we deal with them? How do we get rid of them? We do it through acts of kindness. Through acts of kindness, as the Rebbe told this reporter from CNN that I mentioned earlier, that all that is necessary is to do more goodness and kindness, kindness and goodness. That doesn't mean that that's the only thing we have to do, but everything we do has to be permeated with the idea that we want the world to be a better world. And the way the world will become a better world is when Mashiach will bring about and usher in the redemption. So the ultimate kindness that we can do is everything that we do, we do with an intention that we want to help bring salvation to the whole world. And as Maimonides says, as the Rebbe quotes hundreds of times, that there is a power that a mitzvah, that one single mitzvah has to tip the scales and bring salvation to the whole world. That we have to view the whole world as if it's weighted evenly between good and bad, between merit and the opposite of merit. And one little feather of a mitzvah, if there's such a thing of a feather of a mitzvah, will tip the scales and bring salvation to the whole world. It may take one mitzvah. So every mitzvah we do now, every bit of Torah that we study is, in fact, the ultimate act of kindness because it accelerates and hastens the ultimate redemption when the whole world will enjoy and bask in God's kindness. And we will all see the Abrahamic trait of kindness come to the fore in the most dramatic way.